All right, welcome to another episode of On the Streets with the Emergency Medical Minute. My name is Jordan Orada, and I am very excited for a special presentation today from our friends at Air Life. Today we have Brendan Reese, a flight nurse. We have Matt Spoon, a flight paramedic and outreach coordinator, and Dr. Kaylin Abbott, the medical director for Air Life. We've got a case study that we're going to go over, and so I'll hand it over to you guys. Thanks for having us. Yeah, appreciate it. Excited to be here. So today we're going to go over a case that Brendan and I flew. We were working at one of our metro bases. We got dispatched out for this one. We're going to just go through the whole thing start to finish, and Kaylin's going to fill in all the details, particularly a lot that we didn't know at the time. Yeah. So our dispatch was around 8.50, 9 o'clock on a summer evening, and we were being dispatched for medical call at one of our hospitals just outside the metro area to bring the patient back in. And again, pretty limited information. Initially, we were told that this is a hydrochloric acid ingestion case going from their ED to the PICU. We were airborne about eight minutes after our page. Everything so far had been night vision goggles, safety helicopter ops, all our gear loaded, secured for flights, really no time to plan. Yeah, one of the things that I love about working with Matt is he knows the clinical 100%, but safety, he's amazing at it. And so we're focused on just getting off the ground safe in the dark. And we had a really short flight to the facility. So not a lot of time to prep. We knew it was a pediatric call. We knew there was some kind of toxic caustic ingestion. So we're thinking maybe we're gonna have to maintain an airway circulation, just looking for hypotension and make sure this patient is breathing appropriately. So at this point, Brenda and I had been talking on our very short flight about reversal agents. And admittedly, I'm no toxicologist. Uh, I've dealt with a few tox calls, you know, here and there, same as everybody. But I certainly didn't have anything big alarm bells going off for hydrochloric acid. I knew we would just need to call the poison control center and talk to the ED doc about a reversal agent. But yeah, just like Brenda had said, not a whole lot of uh, information to plan on. So we got to bedside at 21.15. This is 16 minutes from our initial page. So again, that includes everything, getting out to the helicopter, getting off the ground safely, and Brendan and I planning. Just 16 minutes later, we're already at bedside with the patient. This patient was in an ED that was really, really busy. It's one that normally is busy, but this particular night was, even for them, out of the ordinary busy. We were unusually rushed out of the room, which uh, turns out may have actually been really positive for this kid. So I got a quick report from the physician and the RN, and they actually confirmed that this is a hydrofluoric acid exposure rather than hydrochloric acid. And admittedly for me, um, after this presentation and talking to Kayla and Brendan, I'll know for sure how to treat this, but at the time that really didn't ring any huge bells other than we still need a reversal agent and our typical airway breathing circulation. We'd been told poison control had already been contacted and the reversal agent is IV calcium gluconate. They had already started it. So I think to me, I was pretty reassured at that point. So I walk in there and do my rapid assessment at the bedside and the kid looks in the mother of the child's arms, maybe a little bit lethargic, but was awake, maintaining their airway. Breathing seemed adequate and the circulation was adequate too. So kind of checked out the kid. Diaper was really wet and we want to keep these kids warm and dry. So that was a priority to just get that changed. And then I'm going to get this kid on the monitor and packaged up on the flight pram and we're going to scoot. So, so far we've been told that treatment that's been provided has been a water-based decon. We were initially told that a calcium gluconate gel had been applied to the patient. We found out later that that likely had not actually occurred, but was suggested by poison control. The patient had one gram of calcium gluconate and 50 mLs given over the last hour. Now it was finishing up while we were getting to the hospital. Patient had had a little bit of Zofran and had a normal saline bolus already delivered. So kind of, again, it was a bit of a reassuring uh, report and reassuring treatment prior so far. So Matt had done a great job of giving me the clinical picture of what he had gotten in report. So I knew that we needed a good IV access and we were just going to continue this calcium gluconate as the antidote for this tox ingestion. All the labs were pretty unremarkable and EKG was normal. That kid's heart rate was in the 140s, which was on the high end of normal for that age. We had a blood pressure of 110 over 73. Respers were in the upper 20s to lower 30s and non-labored. 99%. Not sure if there was any supplemental oxygen on and the kid was warm. So that was all reassuring. We did, as we were walking out, get told that we had a potassium of 5.7, a chest and abdominal 
abdominal x-ray was unremarkable, which is pertinent to just make sure in an ingestion like this that there's no perforation of the esophagus where we'd have free air in the abdomen or in the chest. The x-ray of the chest looked clear. So we were told all that. We didn't get to see that imaging when we were at the bedside. Yeah. And again, I think usually we'd be able to ask, sit down, talk to the doc, kind of collaborate more on this. And that night they were literally pushing us out of the door, trying to get us gone. Yeah. It was a busy night in that ED, like most EDs in the community. So we know when we've got sick patients, the staff has had their hands full. And so we'll take the information we can get and we'll try to gather what we need without causing too many problems. Yeah. And so at this point, generally, I guess the way to keep it pretty simple for our job is generally we try not to disrupt care. We try to offer the same level and continue that care. So at this point, we are going to call the PICU attending sort of a tradition of ours to touch base with them. It's a bit of a discussion rather than asking for any kind of orders. So we confirm care that's been done. We confirm what our plan of care is going to be and treatment priorities. So I called the PICU attending, gave them the rundown that we got. And they were also on board that since calcium was being given, that we're probably sort of in the clear, or at least on the right path. And basically the end of the conversation was, all right, safe flight. See you guys when you get here. Hey, look, guys, let's have a quick time out and let's yeah. talk about what was the actual exposure? How does a child get exposed to hydrofluoric acid? Did you hear from the doctor or the nurse about what had actually happened to this kid? Yeah. So good question. We were told that the patient, this young toddler, was at his parents' car garage. Not sure if it was a professional garage, amateur garage, but he was using this stuff called heavy-duty acid aluminum cleaner or wheel cleaner. It's something you could get over the counter at, you know, advanced auto parts, whatever. And it's a pretty caustic agent for cleaning your aluminum wheels. The kid, being a normal toddler, reached up at some point to a smaller bottle of it, tipped it over, and it was questionable whether the kid drank the fluids or it was just splashed all over him. But yeah, that was the origin of the exposure was in his parents' car garage. So as soon as it happened, the kid was crying. Of course, parents took him straight to the ER. And so it was, at least for my understanding, minutes into the exposure by the time they got to the emergency department. And we had arrived, Brendan, what was it, like an hour and a half after the kid had gotten to the ED. So all things considered relatively fast. Yes. Yeah. And I think if I remember the case, right, wasn't EMS called? So it was a local EMS brought the kid in. And I think maybe the parents rendezvoused with them at some point to do the handoff. But EMS did bring the child in and there was a report. I just don't remember what the report said from EMS, but something to that effect. Yes. So, yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. So the message relayed to us was definitely a kid was covered in it, could have drank the fluids. So this was a pretty global exposure. And that was what was pushing our priorities of giving the calcium chloride as they found out that this agent has hydrofluoric acid in it as in a relatively heavy concentration for sort of an over-the-counter purchase as well as sulfuric acid, which we found out later. But again, instead of hydrochloric acid, our primary substance was hydrofluoric acid exposure. Okay. So at this point, Brendan has gotten the patient packaged. I think he mentioned earlier, helping with some decon change in the wet diaper. And we had been given a quick report as we were walking out of the hall or down the hall with the patient packaged. So we were given a report from the nurse coming down the hall as we were leaving that the patient's calcium was 6.8, normal range being 8.5, 10.2. So we knew he was hypocalcemic and we were already giving more calcium, but we decided that to be on the safe side, we would give one more dose of calcium. Him. Toxicology was on board with this for poison control. And so we uh, decided to administer a half gram, 500 milligrams of calcium gluconate en route. And we started that at 2135. You want to talk about us not carrying that particular med? So from an air medical standpoint, space and weight is everything. And so we have to be very selective as to what we are going to carry and what we're not going to carry. And in this particular instance, we carry calcium, but we carry calcium chloride. I'm sure many of you know is three times the elemental calcium as calcium gluconate. And so we carry calcium chloride, but not calcium gluconate. So when we need calcium gluconate from an intrafacility transfer, we get that gluconate from the sending facility. And so this patient was on calcium gluconate. It's a little easier on the van and especially if it extravasates, but that's what the child was receiving from the sending emergency department. And he just had a peripheral IV. We didn't have a central line at this point. So, you know, like Caitlin was saying, we don't carry the gluconate. So we talked to the ED pharmacy, got it ordered from the doc, and they gave it to us on the way out. We confirmed contents and started infusing before we even left the ED. So we get to the helipad at 2140. This is officially 25 minutes after patient contact, just to kind of set the scene that everything is pretty fast. Yeah. And may I mention that's remarkable, right? In a big metro area to get from one major facility to another, I think that 
for those who are listening who aren't familiar with air medical transport, I think if you're going to transfer a patient by ground, I think many of us know how long that can take. So by the modality of air, by rotor wing, I think that's remarkable. That's just my opinion. I don't know how you guys feel about it. but Yeah, I agree. And even when I, I first started flying in the, the Denver area, I saw how many agencies were doing these metro transfers, and then I've done them by ground as well and see the benefit of, you know, even doing a within the metro area helicopter transfer, especially for somebody like this kid where you're minutes away from the hospital rather than however long traffic dictates is a huge benefit. So we are loading the patient on the helipad. The patient is lethargic, but still appropriate. No real change in neurostatus. The mother of the child is going to accompany us on the transport. There is an episode of a dark emesis, which we have suction on the aircraft. And so once we got the kid loaded up, we kind of clean that up. And our plan is to kind of monitor for any hemodynamic changes, keep that airway clear. And as Matt liked to say, enjoy a nice flight at dusk. Yeah. And Brenda and I may have differing opinions on taking a parent or not. I don't know how much you and I have really gone into it, but I generally like bringing a parent for patients almost regardless of the acuity. But in a helicopter, it really does have a lot of ups and downs. There's a lot to consider whether the parent is going to be part of the problem or part of the solution, I guess is a way to say it. The biggest issue with us is truly aviation safety, whether the parent will understand that regardless of how big of a crisis something can become, they still need to be in their seat seat belted kind of out of the way and understanding our directions and and our orders if something were to happen in the helicopter. And that can go as far as something on the aviation side goes wrong. We have, uh, you know, something bad in the helicopter happen. But really the more pertinent side is if their child gets sick, there's really not a lot of things that we need them to be doing other than stay seated and calm and, and out of the way in a sense. So for this one, we talked about it. We decided that mom could go with us. Admittedly, this particular patient, kind of like Brendan said, to me, this was a enjoy night flight into Denver. We We've got this one handled. Patients getting what they need and and mom's more than welcome to fly. So I didn't have too much of an issue with that one. Yeah. Famous last words, right? (laughs) Yes, exactly. So we uh, lifted into the air at about 2144. So this particular flight was five minutes from our facility of pickup to our receiving facility. We're watching the mom. We're watching the baby. Everybody's doing fine. And as we begin our final approach and transition through what's called ETL, where the helicopter has a few vibrations is slowing down forward airspeed to hover at 2148. Yeah, so what happened to this pediatric patient with the hydrofluoric acid exposure went from being seemingly totally fine to in extremis and in cardiac arrest over the course of a five minute flight. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about sort of the background of hydrofluoric acid. So hydrofluoric acid's been around for centuries and it was sort of discovered because it dissolved silica. And there were some artists back in the, you know, the 1670s, in particular a guy named Schwanhard, who used hydrofluoric acid for the first time. He used the acid vapors from it to etch glass. And once the utility of it was discovered, and as particularly in the modern age, hydrofluoric acid is used quite a bit in industry. So we use it for brick cleaning. It's used for glass etching and etching of other hard surfaces. It's actually used in the microchip manufacturing industry, electroplating, rust removal, among others. And so it's not a new substance. And if you kind of go back and look at some of the exposures over time, in 1943, the JAMA had actually published a sodium fluoride, I know it's not hydrofluoric acid, but a sodium fluoride poisoning in 263 patients, and there were 47 deaths. And what happened was with sodium fluoride was actually mistaken for powdered milk and was mixed into scrambled eggs, and a whole bunch of people ingested it. What happens to sodium fluoride is it converts to hydrofluoric acid in vivo, and that was what caused all the damage. Fast forward a half a century, and in 1988, there was an oil refinery in Texas that accidentally really the cloud of hydrofluoric gas and 940 patients were exposed to hydrofluoric gas in the the town nearby and 94 people required admission to the hospital. There's been some other cases as well over the years. So in Washington state, their poison control center, I don't know if it's regional or just statewide, but they have actually listed about one death and 48 burns from car washing and truck washing in Washington state. My guess is from rust removal, but that's a guess over about a 10 year 
period, or maybe a 12-year period from 2001 to 2013. And in a four-year period, according to some poison control data from 2011 to 2015, there were about 2,800 single substance exposures and six deaths according to poison control. So hydrofluoric acid exposures do occur, but typically, to be honest with you, it doesn't occur in this fashion. It's usually hand burns from industrial use. It's not due to ingestion. And so what happens with hydrofluoric acid is, is that fluoride is an anion, right? It's got an electronegative charge, and it's actually one of the most electronegative elements in the periodic table. So fluoride being an anion, it's highly electronegative, and what it does is it, it looks for positive charges to try to bind to. So what's positive? Calcium, right? Calcium is Ca2+, and magnesium is Mg2+. So we have these two positive charges, and you've got this very electronegative charge. So like a dog with a bone, it tries to scavenge those. And so what ends up happening is once the, the hydrogen and the fluoride dissociate, the fluoride binds to these calcium and magnesium cations in the tissue, and it causes cellular dysfunction and cell death. It causes neuroexcitation and neuropathic pain and it causes local vasospasm, which leads to ischemia and pain as well. So what can happen with a hydrofluoric acid exposure is you can get life-threatening complications from seemingly trivial exposures. So you may have somebody who has a pretty good story for a hydrofluoric acid exposure, and they look well, and they appear well, but beware. This should raise the hair on your back or wherever it is. It should give you some goosebumps because this is a very serious exposure. So the three main problems with hydrofluoric acid exposures is that you get hypocalcemia, hypomagnesemia, and the cell destruction causes hyperkalemia. So you get this basically stew of cardiotoxicity as well as local tissue toxicity. I can't think of three ways to cause a fatal dysrhythmia that are more important than those three. And so in generally speaking, when you get a dermal exposure to hydrofluoric acid, these chemicals, if you're going to have them for industrial use, come in different concentrations. So if it's a high concentration where you have 20% or more hydrofluoric acid in whatever you're using for whatever purpose, then you have immediate pain. And somebody knows right away, I have an exposure, I'm coming to the emergency department to get this taken care of. However, lower or like household concentrations, um, somewhere between 6 and 12% causes delayed pain. So you may get some someone who was exposed and it was hours ago and they didn't even know they were exposed or maybe they knew and they didn't think much of it because they're not in very much pain and then hours later they start to have extreme horrific exquisite pain at the area of exposure and so typically when you have kind of a lower concentration exposure you get this kind of benign presentation but then what happens is the tissue turns hyperemic or red and then it actually starts to blanch and then you get what's called coagulative necrosis which is very very serious in particular the exposure that this pediatric patient had had a concentration of hydrofluoric acid between 5 and 10 percent. So what we would can kind of consider like a household or a lower concentration. And so hydrofluoric acid exposure where you're actually inhaling the hydrofluoric acid, you can have a variable response. So usually you get kind of mild irritation of the lungs, and then this can lead to, in the end, respiratory distress and failure. And so if you have a hydrofluoric acid ingestion, what happens is, is you get systemic absorption that is rapid and fatal. And so what ends up happening is the patients can present with altered mental status, airway compromise, or they go into these fatal dysrhythmias like V-fib. And the local effects on the stomach can actually cause gastritis with nausea and vomiting. And so how you want to manage these cases really is you need to limit the systemic absorption because as we talked about, this is a recipe for fatal dysrhythmias. And so how do you do that? Well, first you have to decontaminate. So you have to get the patients trauma naked. You have to irrigate with water, right? Like you have to neutral pH solution, just irrigate, irrigate, irrigate irrigate, irrigate. And then you want to somehow apply calcium to the area of exposure. So you can use topical calcium gel, you can use intradermal calcium injections. And if you have somebody with, for example, like a fingertip or say, you know, toes or some kind of exposure at areas of small capillary beds, you can actually put in an arterial line and give intra-arterial calcium because you need that calcium to get into those low pressure cal capillaries to save the tissue in the fingers or the toes. The other thing that you want to do with any kind of exposure is you want to assess for systemic toxicity. So you have to get an EKG. You have to on these patients. I think a lot of what we do in toxicology is get EKGs to look for prolonged QT and to look at the intervals, which is very important and it's an important here as well. But you're looking for hyperkalemic changes as well on these EKGs. You have to place them on a cardiac monitor no matter what the exposure, because if they have systemic toxicity, you're not going to know until you start seeing dysrhythmias on the monitor in some instances. And you also have to
to get labs, which all of these things were done at the sending facility, I believe. And then at this point, you need to rapidly correct any electrolyte derangements which you can identify, either by the labs or by the EKG or by your clinical gestalt. So again, we talked about topical calcium. We talked about giving calcium chloride or calcium gluconate IV or intraarterial. And then you also have to give magnesium sulfate. So you want to replete the mag. And we're talking like four grams over 20 minutes, so a pretty decent dose. And then you need to manage the hyperkalemia aggressively. And then lastly, you want to manage their airway. So if you worry about an inhalation of hydrofluoric acid or any kind of pulmonary exposure, you definitely want to give nebulized calcium gluconate. Nebulized calcium gluconate, you know, you can do a two and a half percent solution. It's benign. It won't hurt I don't think anybody. And so if you suspect this at all, just go ahead and give it and don't worry about it. Put them on the nebulizer. What you want to do is avoid succinylcholine when you're intubating these patients because of the risk of hyperkalemia that may already be present. So you do not want to intubate with succinylcholine. The paralytic of choice in this case, in my opinion, would probably be rocuronium. So Dr. Abbott just explained all the things that we didn't know at the time. <laughs> but, you know, again, like I mentioned before, to continue care, get the patient where they need to be. We were told the reversal agent, we were giving it. And to our surprise, at least mine for sure, we weren't giving enough. So now what? We are still in the air. We're like 300 feet above our pediatric center that we were landing at. Baby is cyanotic. We confirmed pulseless VTAC. Uh, the little bit of aviation lingo that I mentioned, the ETL is a very heavy vibration in some helicopters. The belt's not so bad, but sometimes it can mimic uh, like a course V-fib on the monitor if the patient has those leads that every, every little touch will show up on the monitor. So we we wanted to actually confirm that this is what was happening. And it's very dark. We have four little green lights above the patient. We're under night vision goggles. So it's not like we can just look at the patient and immediately see as evident as it would be in an emergency department. So again, we confirm baby cyanotic. He's got pulses VTAC. We start CPR. And as confidently as I loaded the mom, initially, I was very regretful <laughs> that mom was sitting right next to us. So, I mean, truthfully, I didn't even want to start CPR in this kid in front of her. Not that I wasn't going to, but just felt awful about the situation we had sort of gotten ourselves into. So I start CPR, mom starts screaming. We're in a critical phase of flight. We're caught by surprise with this arrest. We had everything basically that we needed within the cabin of the aircraft, but that's another trick with the flight medicine is, you know, you're limited in space and what's next to you. Well, Matt is such an incredible paramedic operator that he was taking a lot of this in stride. I felt like this was the first time I had ever had a spontaneously breathing patient arrest in the helicopter for me. And so it was kind of like that Mike Tyson punch in the face. I recognized that arrhythmia and I knew we needed to defib this kid. And so I was getting that equipment. I had never imagined that I'd be in a situation where we would only be able to do single provider CPR. The helicopter is kind of like a 1980s VW rabbit where if you turned around the front passenger seat into the rear, that's about the space that we're working in. And not only that, but we're doing it in the dark with an understandably distraught mom and a pilot who's trying to land a helicopter. All the fun. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think that can't be overstated, right? That kind of sheer horror or terror. It really can't. I mean, how many times have patients been alive and talking and then arrested on you? Not to mention this is a pediatric patient. So we've kind of touched on a little bit, but we landed about one minute after the cardiac arrest sort of initiated. And I can't say enough about our pilot that really, really helps to have a pilot that's keyed into this type of work. It's not just a helicopter pilot that knows how to fly the helicopter. Our pilot that night knew right away because of our intercom system. And he heard me talking to our dispatch, asking for help on the helipad that the patient was critically sick. And, and I'm sure he recognized the patient was in arrest based on what we were saying. He knew the mom was freaking out. He knew we were in a critical phase of flight and he knew he still had to get us safe on the ground. And then immediately we've got a procedure to shut down the helicopter that takes the pilot a few minutes to knock out. But as soon as he's done with that, he was able to help us wrangle mom, make sure she's taken care of, make sure she knows where to go and is safe on this rooftop helipad that doesn't have railings, you know? So it really was a huge benefit to have the kind of pilot that we had on our side that night. So once we're on the ground and our pilot 
shutting the helicopter down. We instruct mom to remain seated. And like I mentioned, the pilot did such a great job of helping us help mom. Brenda and I knew that the cause of rest is hypocalcemia. We were already treating it and apparently not treating it quick enough. We know epi's good, but for this patient, calcium's better. And Brenda and I had a really quick debate. And, and I don't say debate because we're being super proper here. We really did just have a debate about this where I wanted to give calcium chloride because the patient's in a rest right now. Brendan wanted to give calcium gluconate because the patient has a peripheral IV. It's life versus limb discussion. I kind of wanted to be the big dumb paramedic and Brendan was the calculated ICU nurse. And fortunately for us, patient was uh, defibrillated and CPR continued. But before we could make the decision to give calcium, the patient started breathing against the bag valve mask, crying, and had gotten out of his uh, VTAC. Yeah, and I did increase that rate of calcium. So we doubled the rate of the calcium gluconate that we were giving. And Matt had a great point about life first limb there with calcium chloride. Yeah, I, I'm glad we didn't actually have to make that decision. I, I think our hand was sort of being forced in a sense. And luckily for us, the patient had ROSC and we could continue just what Brendan said, doubling down on the calcium gluconate. And I think it's also worth mentioning how fast all this happens and how you are task saturated. You've got a landing helicopter. You've got a limited workspace. You have a totally reasonably distraught mother. You're trying to manage this very complicated case. And you've got to make very quick decisions and act very quickly. Yeah. And for those familiar with the, the helicopter we're in or any air medical helicopter, there's just not a lot of room. It doesn't matter if you're in an A-star, if you're in a Bell 407, if you're in a Eurocopter 145, there's still not a lot of room. This one, we were fortunate that we were landing when the arrest occurred. We were able to secure the helicopter and Brendan and I get out. We were able to open our cargo door and sort of pivot the patient outside of the helicopter, which effectively gave us all the room we needed to work. What we were hoping for is we call for help, we'd land, the elevator would come up, and the entire PICU team would come streaming out and take care of us. What actually happened is we heard the elevator behind us. Brendan and I are working on CPR and bagging this patient, debating our calcium. And we turn around and we get one security guard and an RT who had no supplies on him because the security guard happened to see him walking down the hall on his way up. You know, we definitely felt like asking for help was going to result in a bit more than that. But, you know, they did the best they could for sure. So we did get ROSC and we're looking at this kid and the blood pressure is a little low. So a lot lot of things are coming up. We're going to need to improve our IV access, looking at an IO, and I am starting to draw up some push dose epi to kind of be able to temporize this post-arrest situation. While Matt is coordinating all the help and getting this kid moved off the helicopter onto a stretcher so that we can head to the PICU. Yeah, and Kayla mentioned the realities of the event versus the podcast. Just to put it out there, communication is very difficult on the top of a hospital. We're literally on the roof. We don't have any power because the helicopter shut down. We've got cell phones, of course, but who are we going to call within the hospital other than dispatch? So we've got a busy patient. We've got no communication. And so far, we've got two folks that have arrived to help. Fortunately for us, for the patient, PICU team did arrive, literally like the entire PICU team. The attending was there. I believe there's a fellow there. There were lots of nurses. There was RT. And, you know, we're told every now and then that an EMS hears a helicopter coming over the horizon. And, you know, when they've got a super critical patient and really need the help, that it's a huge relief. And I remember sensing that when I worked 911 EMS. And that's what this felt like. We saw the PICU team coming out of the elevator. It's like, oh my God. Okay. Finally, we've got all the help we need where, you know, things will work out now. So uh, at 2200, we arrived in the PICU. We were finally given our first ionized calcium throughout this whole patient course of care so far. So they did a point of care labs and his ionized calcium was 0.9. So despite giving this tiny patient a gram and a half of calcium so far, plus the extra 500 we gave during the arrest of so two grams total, he's still low on calcium. But yeah, the first confirmed labs, I was still surprised by that. So we're getting the patient moved over. Matt is doing an incredible job just giving a handover of his complex events to the PICU staff. And he's just masterful in integrating with the team. He's helping put in that IO now that the patient is in the bed and getting settled and coordinating with the PICU attendings about doing the intervention in with them. And so while we're getting this kid stabilized in transfer, they're administering some meds and kind of getting their labs done. 
Yeah, so the patient got another two boluses of calcium chloride on arrival to the PICU. Like Brendan said, we started an IO. Surprisingly enough, the PICU was on our side as well. You need central access and meds quickly, just start an IO. So fortunately for me, nobody was really feeling it. So they let me start the IO, which is great. We did those two doses of calcium chloride, 20 milligrams per kilo. They also gave two doses of sodium bicarb, two milli equivalents per kilo. And then we gave a saline bolus. Like Brendan mentioned, we have a really good working relationship with our pediatric center. So I had the pleasure of working with the attending and just asking her if I could intubate the patient. She was totally fine with it. So we got ready for our standard intubation. We've got quite a long procedure for a pre-intubation checklist. And the patient, again, at this point has pulses, is somewhat stable as being treated. So we were preparing to intubate and the patient displayed seizure-like activity and had another VTAC arrest. CPR is performed again. They gave another dose of calcium chloride as well as magnesium and ROSC was achieved. So in the span of two hours, the patient has now received a gram of calcium gluconate plus the 500 milligram doses twice, which equals two grams of calcium. He's also had three doses of 20 mLs per kilo of calcium chloride, just 480 milligrams. And our standard pediatric dose of calcium generally would be 20 milligrams per kilogram. This kid has had the equivalent of 310 milligrams per kilogram at this point in just the span of two hours. So... The patient achieved ROSC thanks to the quick thinking of these two excellent flight crew members and ended up having a several week stay in the pediatric ICU, of course. Had some complications, some pulmonary hemorrhage. They continued calcium gluconate nebulization for several days. Ultimately, the child was weaned off the ventilator and spontaneous respirations resumed. There were no further dysrhythmias. They were able to wean the child off of all of the pressors over the course of several days, weaned off sedation. They did a gastric lavage with calcium gluconate as well during the inpatient stay. And there were some other kind of details, which I'm not sure are really worth going into entirely with this. However, the child was able to leave the hospital neurologically intact about 14 days later. So made a full recovery as far as we know. And I can mention too, so after that second arrest in the PICU where they started treating again with calcium chloride, magnesium, when I'd been preparing to intubate, once we got ROSC, we still needed to intubate the patient. The PICU attending was happy to let me continue that process. So we are aside the patient and we used their CMAC instead of our glide scope, but same, same video laryngoscopy. So we started the intubation procedure nice and slow. Everyone in the room really wanted to get an eye on this kid's airway and see if there were burns or destruction in the, in the kids' upper airways. And as we progressed in, there was really no additional swelling, not a lot of redness, no additional secretions. It was a pretty clean and easy intubation, luckily for me. It, I think it made Brendan and I look pretty good to show up in a PICU and intubate this kid in one pass. But luckily, in the end, for the patient, it didn't appear that he really had swallowed much of this fluid, and it seemed to be like a dermal exposure instead. So I think in summary, as I mentioned earlier, even trivial exposures of hydrofluoric acid can be extremely dangerous in patients, and that's because of how electronegative fluoride is and how it scavenges all of the positive ions, including calcium and magnesium. And so this was a patient who was more or less well-appearing and quickly decompensated right before our crew's very eyes. The amount of calcium that's required to prevent, I guess, toxicity and arrest was much larger, I think, than anyone anticipated with this case because the child looked so well. So I think overall, the take-home point of this is that hydrofluoric acid exposures are serious until proven otherwise, and you should treat them with a healthy amount of respect. And I just commend our crew here, Matt and Brandon, who are sitting here with me. I mean, this child survived because of their quick thinking. And so I guess it just can't be overstated. One of the take-home points for me was just from the time that I did 911 EMS, I think had I been given this patient then, I would have given epinephrine three to five minutes during that arrest until I ran out of HEPI or somebody else got there. Admittedly, I haven't been in the 911 sphere here in Colorado, and I haven't been in 911 outside of the helicopter in about seven years. But this was one of those arrests where I'm lucky or we're lucky to be supported by the docs that we've got. And just generally given the latitude to say, we know what the cause is and we need to treat the cause. I mean, the kid certainly needed EPI. And I think at some point during an arrest, got epi eventually, I think in the PICU, but we were given the benefit of the doubt to say, 
calcium uh, is the antidote and we just need to give the calcium for this arrest. So I'm, I'm happy that that's sort of progressed in the pre-hospital world that we don't necessarily have to only stick within a very rigid set of, of guidelines. We can really do what is needed to be done or the necessary antidote. And I would argue that the kid needed shock first before epi. Sure. And epi probably, you know, there's a lot of data out there that shows that the more epi you give, the more deleterious it is and that you, you know, you're really priming the heart for dysrhythmia with epi in a lot of cases. And so I don't know if I 100% agree or buy. I think the kid needed epi because he needed vasopressor support while in the PICU, but run the arrest should be run like a normal arrest. And you did that, but you only have two arms and there were only two of you and you're on the roof of a hospital. I mean, what can you do? Right. Yeah. And I I hate to fully dog Epi in a podcast just because I feel like everyone's gonna be like, yeah, see, screw Epi. Yeah. It's like, uh, oh yeah, he he needed it. It's still in the book. But yes, I I think I agree. So this is amazing. I'm sitting here just listening to the story for the first time. I've heard snippets of it and I'm just like, I'm throwing my hands up. I'm, my eyes are wide open. My jaw's dropping. This is wild. And the thoughtfulness of you guys in that team mentality just blows me away. And I work with you guys and I know that's how you always are. And so I think it's so cool to be able to, like Dr. Abbott said, it's like, we can really slow it down here and we can talk about it and go Monday morning quarterback this thing all day long. But to think about putting yourself in the shoes on the top of this helipad and then having to try to figure out, well, which calcium do we even want to give? And in hindsight now, if you were in those shoes again, after having gotten to think about it, it, what would the choice be? I think if our hand was forced and the patient stayed in arrest, I think I would still stand on the calcium chloride. But again, I, I jokingly called myself a big dumb paramedic with that. But I do think it's my background of EMS, pre-hospital, not shotgun approaches to everything, but for that particular thing, I think I would rather risk, I don't know, some damage with calcium chloride and reverse the arrest. But Brendan, you may have a totally different background and, and different thought. No, I I 100% agree with you. And I mean, we could have done an IO, use it as a central line rather than giving it through peripheral and done that very quickly. You mentioned being able to have some run through this prior, so simulation of it in our ongoing training or something. We may have been better prepared to say like, oh, we need a heavy duty antidote, so we need an IO. But I think in that moment, at least for me, we, we had access and we needed to give a reversal. Yeah. And even an IO on a pediatric small patient is not a trivial procedure. It's not something we do very frequently, and it takes longer than you would an adult patient for sure. Yeah, but I think that's a great point. I think that's something that a lot of free hospital providers don't really realize that an IO is a central access point. We usually just do it as a Hail Mary when someone's in cardiac arrest or we can't get other access. But when you need it for a specific reason like that, it functions better because it is more central. And I think that's a really awesome pearl to pull out of this that you guys probably didn't even think that you were going to share, right? (laughs) Yep. Perfect. Any final thoughts you guys have on this case? I mean, this is easy to slow walk through it. And I think that our listeners are going to appreciate that this was a very, very tense scenario that you guys got. Certain things fell into place at the right time. There's certain some luck involved, but a lot of preparation, a lot of planning, a lot of knowledge to give this kiddo a shot at having a good outcome, which is pretty amazing. Yeah. I mean, the three of us have worked together on this presentation for a few months now, and we actually presented at the ENA conference this year. And so I think as a result of that, we've talked about it, we've thought about it, we've written it down, we've turned it into a PowerPoint. So I think you're right that the reality of it, at least for me, is, you know, I don't readily, didn't, now I know, but didn't readily know the immediate antidote. I didn't know how serious hydrofluoric acid was. I had zero anticipation that the kid was going to crash on us the way he did. So, you know, that was one of the calls that just really turned upside down quickly. And we were fortunate to, A, have the background that we both have. We had the training that we currently continue and the supplies and resources. So like Jordan said, I think it ended up being kind of the a perfect storm on two sides, much worse than planned and much better resourced than we could imagine. Yep. I don't feel like I performed as well as I wanted to. And I think that's just kind of how we do things. We kind of look at all the things that we didn't do well, and instead of look at the where, where we made good, wise decisions. And so I'm glad the patient had a good outcome. I think I would have been a lot harder on myself if the patient didn't have a good outcome. And that's just the nature of this work. We lifted around 9 p.m. I genuinely thought, yeah, okay, we just got to move the kid to the right place. This is this is just a transfer, you know. And before you know it, we're at 3 a.m. We've done procedures on this kid that we would have never guessed and it was definitely a much different call than I thought it would be even after seeing the patient. Yeah. All right, I got one last question now. In the pre-hospital setting, thinking about how much calcium this kid needed. If you're in a rural setting, you find this, you even recognize what's going on. Nobody carries that much calcium. 
what do you do? You're just working a, a cardiac arrest without the thing you need for an extended period of time trying to transport this kid. Any other things that maybe a rural ambulance that has a little bit more than air medical might have on the rig to help supplement and try to give this kid a little better chance? That's a great question. So to sort of generically answer your question, I think overall a patient like this needs a place with near unlimited resources, right? You really do need a tertiary or a quaternary system, but you have to get them to that point, right? So you run a typical sort of ACLS resuscitation. If you recognize that it is hydrofluoric acid and you are worried about calcium and magnesium, you replete. And if you go through your entire supply, you go through your entire supply and you keep going. If you can call for air medical resources, if you are in a place that's rural and you're very, I guess, geographically far from a tertiary or a quaternary care system or a hospital, you know, you can also, when you do call, you can say, you know, please bring everything you've got. Or, you know, can you bring extra calcium or magnesium because we think we know what's going on? Because that helps us on our end, our dispatchers to know, like, maybe, you know, and we do this with blood products, for example, if somebody's got a hemorrhage and we know we're going to that, we can stop at the blood bank and pick up extra blood products. And so if it comes down to it and you need to request those things of an air medical system, then certainly you can. I think that's a huge point. And I think that a lot of our providers, they know that helicopters are a great resource for them, but they don't always think about that. Bringing supplies with when we know we're going to need more of that stuff. Yeah. And I mean, as, as a paramedic, I am all about paramedics wanting to own their own patient, take care of their own. You don't always need a helicopter. I'm happy to come fly for sure, but I get it. I'd like to keep my own patients too. I think that this is an operational question rather than clinical. I mean, it's just like crow fab with uh, snake bite season. It's like Kayla mentioned with getting more blood for let's say postpartum hemorrhage. And that's beyond just our standard load out of blood. That's go to the blood bank, try to get an MTP to take with you. This one is if you're rural and you suspect hydrofluoric acid, I think you don't necessarily drive the two plus hours to the pediatric center. I think you go to your local hospital, you get a plan, you get the resources you need, and then you go to that pediatric center. I think you're going to find yourself out of equipment pretty quickly. Yeah, I agree with that statement. And by MTP, you mean massive transfusion protocol. Yeah, thanks. Well, I think we could probably continue to talk about this case on and on and on. But to respect your guys' time, I'll just end by saying thank you so much for coming and presenting this. And we will make sure we include some contact information along with the notes on this podcast. So if you want some further education, you have questions about it, you can reach out to Matt Spoon and potentially get some of the team to come out and do some education with your team or uh, just bounce some emails back and forth. So thank you guys so much. Yeah. Thanks, Jordan. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Jordan.